Hello, good morning and welcome everyone, or good afternoon on the East Coast. So, I am Mark Fuccio, I'm IVP of Products here at Drobo, and we're very pleased today on this webinar to have a very special guest, Mike Bombic of Bombic Software. And as many of you know, the title is, uh, we're gonna give a deep dive of using Carbon Copy Cloner to back up uh, your Mac. And um, you know, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank our special guest, and we'll send the screen and present a role over to Mike Bombick. How are you doing? Thank you very much for uh, having me on the program. Yeah, so actually, maybe before you begin, um, Carbon Copy Cloner is a well-known uh, tool in the Mac community. Maybe just give people just a uh, you know, quick overview of uh, how it got started and your role on and off, uh, you know, being you know developer and not developer, and recently you know, charging it and expanding and building business full time around it. Sure, yeah, a lot of people probably uh, would be surprised to find out that uh, I didn't go to college to be a software engineer. I actually went to college uh, to do biology, and uh, when I first started in, in college, I thought I wanted to do something in genomics. Uh, I have an identical twin. I had lots of questions about, uh, you know, how are we just subtly different? And uh, then we were lucky enough to have a seminar on campus, and a guy came in to talk specifically about twins and their differences. He answered all my questions. <laughs> I was done with genomics at that point. Uh, so I turned to um, aquatic ecology. I got my master's in aquatic ecology, studying uh, zebra mussels and round gopies up on Lake Erie. and. Uh, Pretty late into my thesis, uh, I realized that uh, being a, a discoverer was probably not my calling. And uh, I got into, uh, into Max, and uh, I was the guy that kind of managed the, uh, the graduate student Mac lab. And I started developing some solutions for uh, making the management a little bit easier. And uh, after I, I graduated, I went on to, uh, to do some support work at the university. And uh, that's when I saw a need for mass deployment of Max, and that's when I invented Carbon Copy Cloner. And uh, shortly after that, I wound up at Apple, and I worked for Apple for about eight years. And uh, I enjoyed my time at Apple, but found that uh, I could be a lot more creative outside of Apple. Uh, so I left Apple in 2010, uh, poured my heart and all of my, my sweat into uh, Carbon Copy Cloner, uh, and started to build a company. And uh, over the last five years, uh, we've hired many people. We're up to seven now. And uh, we actually just hired a, uh, a new engineer back in uh, June. So our team has expanded quite a bit. And uh, that's, that's Scoop to Nuts, our product. Um, we're really excited to continue uh, investing in the product. And uh, it's, it's still a lot of fun. I really enjoy dealing with individual end users, too. Uh, you know, that's uh, I worked mm -hmm. in and education and enterprise markets at Apple. And uh, I really enjoy now working with individual end users, prosumers, people like that. It's a lot of fun. Okay, so one other question that uh, the, the Drobo <clears throat> sales team gets is, when they make recommendations, they'll <clears throat> mention CCC and some of the other well-known tools. <clears throat> and the question comes up of where to buy it, because it's not in the app store, so maybe you want to just share a note and comment about that? Sure. I was actually one of the first people that uh, Apple reached out to uh, when they came up with the App Store concept. They, they wanted to ironically uh, promote my product within the App Store. And uh, I had looked at the rules and thought, I didn't think I would be able to put my application in the App Store because, you know, cloning system files, it requires elevated privileges. And sure enough, that was the case. And they had to renege their offer, um, but that's that's pretty much the gist of it. You know, we make copies of system files, a backup of your your system, and in order to do that, we need elevated privileges, and that makes us persona non grata in the Mac App Store. Um, in retrospect, I'm I'm not disappointed with that. Um, you know, I don't think the Mac App Store is such a great deal. Um, maybe it's good for marketing and stuff like that, but. 30% is a pretty big cut. We're pretty happy with our current distribution mechanism right now. Well, given your success from you know, one person to eight in about five or six years, certainly you have uh, a lot of success and wind in your sales. 
So yes. maybe with yeah. that, yeah. So maybe with that, uh, let's transition and start the presentation and let our listeners see and appreciate exactly why uh, your quality product has led to such uh, phenomenal success. Okay. Uh, so we're definitely going to do a deep dive, but just real quick, I want to kind of cover that the higher level, uh, what exactly carbon copy cleaner is. CCC is a backup utility for OS 10, and it works by copying files from one volume to another. Uh, so for example, you can use CCC to copy your startup disk to a USB, Firewire, or Thunderbolt disk that's attached to your Mac. It works with other disks too. That's actually a common question that we get. So if you have a second disk or partition that has just media, for example, you can configure a CCC backup task to copy that volume to a backup disk. Uh, you can even copy an external disk to an external disk. So there's, and folders to folders. Lots of different ways that you can configure file copying backup tasks. CCC backups are non-proprietary. So when CCC copies one volume to another, the folder hierarchy is preserved. When you browse the contents of the destination, it looks exactly like the source. So if you have files in your desktop folder on the source, those are gonna show up in that same desktop folder on your destination device. Uh, there's one UI element in the finder that I think is really helpful for people when they're looking for files uh, on a volume, and that's the, uh, the path bar at the bottom. If you go to the view menu and choose show path bar, uh, you'll see that show up. And I find that helpful because we find a lot of people will leverage the sidebar and the finder for storing shortcuts to folders. And you don't necessarily know where that folder is on your startup disk, and that can cause some confusion when you go to look for those files on the destination. Uh, so if you choose show path bar, you can see that folder hierarchy on your source disk, and then you know immediately where to go uh, to find those files on your backup disk. Beyond yeah, making a simple backup though, CCC makes a bootable backup. So how's a bootable backup different from an ordinary copy of your files? Well, suppose that you're a, uh, a photographer, for example, and you're working at your Mac, and uh, maybe you've got a deadline, some people are really waiting on their wedding photos, and you're working along, and all of a sudden, your Mac gets really, really slow, and nothing seems to be working. And all of a sudden, you get that dreaded spinning pinwheel of death. You restart the system, and nothing happens. And this actually happened to me uh, a few years ago when I was at the developer conference, um, Apple's developer conference. I walked into a session, opened up my laptop, and it just hung. And I restarted the system, and I got that flashing hard drive with the question mark icon on it. And normally, when you know, the, the layman encounters this scenario, they just panic, and they, they don't know what to do. And uh, they run around like a chicken with their head cut off. But with a CCC bootable backup, you simply restart the system, attach your backup disk, and then reboot your system from the backup disk. You're up and running. So in addition to protecting your data, a CCC bootable backup protects your productivity as well. Task setup is simple. You choose a source, choose a destination, and then click the clone button. And CCC starts copying your files. Restoring from a backup is equally simple. Uh, again, the backups are non-proprietary. So if you've got just a few items that you want to restore, maybe you've lost some files from your desktop, you accidentally deleted them or something like that, you can find those files on your backup disk and simply drag them over via the finder uh, back to uh, wherever you want to restore them to. If or when you need to restore applications or system files to your startup disk, you restart your Mac from the backup disk um, to do that restore. You can change the startup disk via the startup disk preference pane in the system preferences application if your current startup disk is still functional. If it's not, you can restart your Mac and hold down the option key. And when your backup disk is attached to your Mac, it will appear in the startup manager and you can proceed to boot from it right there. Once booted from the backup, you open up CCC, and then restoring is as simple as the initial backup. 
simply swap the source and destination. So in this case, CCC backup is now my source. I choose Macintosh HD, which is either my original disk with missing files or whatnot, uh, or my replacement disk. Click the clone button, CCC copies everything back, and then you reboot from your original disk and everything is thankfully back to normal. In addition to backing up to a locally attached hard drive, you can also back up to network attached storage. So for example, if you have a hard drive connected to a router, or if you have file sharing enabled on another Mac, you can mount that storage in the finder and specify it as a destination to your CCC backup task. Shared storage devices appear in the finder sidebar uh, by default. You click on a device, then click the button to connect to that service, and then authenticate using credentials of a user on that device. Click the connect button, and then the share points hosted by that device are listed there in the finder. Uh, next, you click on a share point to mount it, and once that SharePoint is mounted in the Finder. You can, of course, browse the SharePoint in the Finder. Uh, but those SharePoints also show up in CCC source and destination selectors. Uh, so in this example, I want to back up my pictures folder to the SharePoint. So I'll choose, choose a folder from the source selector and select my pictures folder as the source. Next, I'll select the NAS SharePoint as the destination. And now my task is all set. Uh, the performance of backing up to NAS volume is always going to be slower than backing up to a locally attached disk. For the fastest backup, we definitely recommend having a FireWire USB or Thunderbolt disk attached directly to your Mac. Um, but in some cases, the performance of backing up to NAS uh, is also significantly affected by an attempt to preserve extended attributes on files. So this is just one little gotcha I wanted to raise your attention to. Extended attributes are extra data that's attached to a file by the application that created it. Uh, so for example, a photo application may attach a thumbnail preview to an image file. Uh, normally, when you copy one file, a file from one volume to another, those extended attributes go along for the ride. Um, but that's not necessarily the case with the NAS volume. Some NAS volumes don't support them well, or you know, it just takes longer to, uh, to copy those little bits of, of data. Extended attributes can always be recreated by the application that created it. Uh, so when backing up to a NAS device, it's often faster to disable support for extended attributes. To do that, click the, advanced, uh, the Use Advanced Settings button at the bottom of CCC's task window, and then enable the option to not preserve extended attributes. Uh, so just a little tip for when backing up to NAS volumes. Um, sometimes if you see a performance issue, copies are going a little bit slower than you expect, uh, check that box to not preserve extended attributes. <clears throat> Another thing that you can do to improve performance when backing up to a NAS device is to back up to a disk image file. A disk image behaves more like a locally attached device, and it also aggregates all of those little file system requests to the underlying NAS volume. So especially when copying lots of smaller files, it can be much faster to back up to a disk image. To back up to a disk image, Choose New Disk Image from CCC's Destination Selector. Then select a location on your mounted NAS volume to save the disk image. There's a couple configuration options here. Uh, you can choose between a read-write versus a read-only disk image. Uh, and you can choose whether the disk image should be encrypted. Uh, typically, you would choose a read-write disk image, especially if you want to um, do ongoing regular backups to this disk image. Uh, but a read-only disk image would be good for archival purposes. So if you've got a bunch of stuff that you want to archive, you can dump it into a read-only disk image uh, and then set it off uh, for long-term storage. You can also choose between sparse image and sparse bundle disk image. Uh, up to Mac OS Sierra, it was a bit of a toss-up on which to choose. Um, with Mac OS Sierra, though, sparse bundle disk images are now supported on more NAS devices, so that's the preferred format. So now the task is all set to back up to a disk image. Uh, when the backup task runs, CCC will create the disk image, copy files to it, then eject the disk image. And when you run the task again in the future, CCC can automatically mount the network volume, mount that same disk image file, copy only the items that have changed since the last backup, eject the disk image, and finally eject the NAS volume as well. 
That automation is pretty okay, important. Mike? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we're, we're getting a bunch of questions here, so maybe it uh, would be a good time to uh, sure. work in the backlog. Um, there's some questions, you're talking a little bit more about uh, a bootable backup and you know how is that different from sort of you know an ISO file and what sort of, that's question number one. Question number two, what sort of disk or disk uh, system do you need to create uh, a bootable backup on top of? Sure, um, yeah, let's definitely tackle the, the, the question about bootable backup and NAS volumes head on. Um, a disk image is not bootable and you cannot make a bootable backup on a NAS volume. So if you want to have that bootable backup, and that's certainly what we recommend as your primary backup, you need to have some disk attached directly to your Macintosh. So that's typically USB, Firewire, or Thunderbolt. Um, and what, what kind of disk? I mean, there's a lot of different disks that you could attach to your Mac. Uh, Drobo volumes also work well as bootable backups. Um, what we recommend, so, what I typically yeah. recommend, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, what, what I would comment is uh, one capability on Drobo is you can make a s dedicated volume. You know, so this, on say some of the USB or Thunderbolt drives, you can create a dedicated volume and use that for say doing the bootable backup. So that contains all your OS and system files. And then the second volume you can use for putting your media and other working files. I think you know, the benefit of that is you have two volumes and you're sort of separating. You can think of it as maybe two partitions on a, on a hard drive. Uh, you know, so you can use that uh, one for the booting, bootable backup of your system. And then the other one is you know, because of the enormous capacity, it could be a backup of data on your Mac as well as a repository primary storage for you know, other media or other project files. Right. Um, one of the most important things about backup, though, is also that you know you're putting your media on a physically disparate device, and that's yes. you know a, you can make a copy of your startup disk files on your startup disk, and that's technically a copy of your files, but you know put it on external storage so that if your disk fails, you've got that that backup on a different physical device. Um, but then again, right. that flows. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that flows into uh, two other questions that uh, that were asked here in the chat window pod. Uh, one is about using CCC to you know, to sync two different Drobos, um, and then the other question, related question was you know, whether it does a full copy or incremental copy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, CCC will copy just the items that have changed. So you know, you pick your source and destination. CCC is going to scan the source and destination look at the file size and modification date of each of your files, and then copy just the items that differ, either based on the file's name, the path, uh, the file size, or the modification date. So yeah, you could use CCC to keep two, two devices in sync. Uh, it's a one-way backup. You know, We don't do two-way synchronization. I hang my hat on never modifying the source, uh, and that comes up frequently. I, I can draw a line in the sand and say, I never make changes to the source. Um, but yeah, you know, if you wanted to keep two volumes in sync so that uh, you always have kind of a live backup of one disk on another disk, you can use CCC for that, and it will only copy the items that have changed between the two devices. Right, OK. Uh, another question relates to going back to uh, using a, a bundle of some sort and whether those can be encrypted. Yeah. So. Uh, a Sparse bundle disk image or a sparse image, those disk images can be encrypted. And uh, you know, in CCC, when you choose new disk image, uh, you just choose from the pop-up menu uh, either no encryption, AES-128 encryption, or AES-256 encryption. And after you click OK, you're prompted to, to plug in a password. And uh, then when CCC creates that disk image, it will uh, create it as an encrypted disk image. Are there performance or other trade-offs between the two different encryption methods? Uh, for AES-128 encryption, the, the performance difference versus a non-encrypted disk image is pretty negligible. Uh, on an older system, you're, you're likely to see a performance impact of AES-256 encryption. I think that it's improving quite a bit with the newer systems, newer Macs. 
not newer operating system necessarily, but the newer Macs, uh, the hardware is definitely geared towards those sorts of encryption tasks. Uh, so it's not as much of an issue as it used to be. Right, right, okay. Um, let's see. Um, I think I think that's uh, that's that's the majority of uh, questions relating to backup. There's some others here we'll come back to at the end of the uh, discussion. You know, for, yes, for yes. attendees. And um, I'm sure what I talk about. Else in, I'm sure what I'll talk about next will bring up some more questions too. Okay, so uh, again, automation is pretty important. A backup is most useful when it's up to date. So you want your backup tasks to run on a regular basis, and you really want that to happen without user intervention. To schedule a backup task, click on the scheduler icon, and then you indicate how frequently it should run. Uh, CCC's got options to run it daily, uh, sorry, hourly, daily, uh, weekly, and monthly, and then you can adjust things like the re repeat interval, start time, and things like that. Uh, there's also some options specific to uh, how the system sleeps and what and you know whether the task will wake the system or uh, skip the task if it's sleeping. By default, CCC will schedule a wake event uh, for a little bit before the task is scheduled to run. So the wake event will wake the system, and then CCC will will wake up and and run your backup task. Um, that actually turns on the display for your screen, though. So if you want to have a less intrusive backup, uh, you can actually take advantage of OS X's dark wake cycles, uh, also known as power nap, also known as maintenance wake. Uh, and with that, so the way that that works is every hour or a couple hours uh, during the night when your system is sleeping, it will wake up, but it won't turn on the display. And at that time, uh, various background tasks can run. And CCC gets a wake event uh, notification at that time, and it can see, did my scheduled time elapse? If it did, it'll go ahead and, and run the backup task. Um, then there's also some options in here for intelligent handling of um, the source or destination being missing. Uh, a lot of people are on the go. You take your laptop, throw it in a bag, and hit the road. If your backup task is scheduled to run and you know your backup disk isn't attached, uh, you can either, with the default configuration, have CCC pop up a little dialog that says, hey, your disk isn't attached, and it'll run right away when you plug it in. Or, if that's too intrusive, you can check a box and say, you know, don't tell me about the source or the destination being missing, and then CCC will just run it again the next time it's scheduled to run. Uh, tasks can also be chained together for peak efficiency, um, and we can also do things like unmount the destination volume, um, run shell scripts, and, and things like that. Uh, so in this particular example, I've got my daily bootable backup scheduled to run at 5.30 uh, every day to a locally attached disk. And when this task is finished, it will unmount the destination volume and then run another backup task. Uh, and then so when this task is finished, that pictures to NAS task uh, fires off automatically and then runs to completion. This is kind of nice because I could just schedule both the tasks to run. Uh, but maybe I don't want them to run at the same time. Maybe that uh, slows things down, or um, you know, maybe I've got multiple backup to NAS tasks, and I don't want them flooding my network with traffic. Uh, so you could have them run back to back, and then they'll they'll run in as short of amount of time as possible. Uh, also implicit with this destination volume unmounting post-flight task, at the beginning of the task, CCC will automatically mount your destination volume for you. Uh, so you can keep that destination volume unmounted. As long as it's attached to your Mac, CCC will mount it automatically at the beginning of the task, run the task, and then it can unmount it at the end. CCC offers several ways to get insight into your backup task activity. Uh, it sends notifications to OS X's notification center whenever a task starts or finishes. You can configure tasks to send an email at the end of every backup task or only when errors occur during the backup. Uh, and then there's also a CCC menu bar application that gives you an indication of when a task is running, uh, and that can also present a miniature task progress window, uh, like you see on the bottom right here. The menu bar application also presents a list of all of your tasks and shows when they last ran and the status of that last run. Uh, you can also start and stop the tasks from that menu, 
you can open CCC from that menu. Uh, you can also open the task history for a particular task right from that menu. For more detail about when and how your tasks ran, you can click on the History button in CCC's toolbar. The Task History window lists all of your task events, how many files and how much data was copied, the size of the data set, and whether any errors occurred. When errors do have occurred, a list of the affected files is presented, and CCC offers advice for dealing with each specific error condition. And there's probably over 100 different uh, error condition scenarios that we've tackled, and we issue advice um, specific to each one. So sometimes you get a particular error, and depending on whether it's a locally attached volume versus a NAS volume, we give you different advice. And that brings me to a fairly common error condition, unreadable files. Uh, sectors fail, it's not uncommon, and it's not necessarily an indication of imminent disk failure. This is such a common error condition that CCC has extensive procedures in place for working with these. So as CCC is working through your backup, if it encounters a file that it can't read, uh, and what I mean by that is if the disk physically cannot um, produce the data that's on disk, if it issues uh, an input-output error, CCC will stop reading that file, and then it'll move on to the next file. Um, towards the end of the backup task, once CCC has taken a crack at copying every single file on the disk, um, it will make a second read attempt at the end of that first pass. Statistically speaking, a second read attempt has a moderate chance of actually getting the data off the disk. Um, it all depends on, you know, how bad the damage is to that particular sector. Um, but a third or fourth attempt is statistically unlikely to, to, to get the data off. Um, what that means is that by the end of the task, CCC has made an attempt to copy every file off of that disk, and any files that it was not able to copy, there's just a really poor chance that you're going to be able to recover that file. Uh, so at the very end of the task, CCC will issue a detailed report listing all of the files that could not be read, and it will then, actually here's an example of what that report looks like. Uh, so it presents that list of affected items. When you click on the item, uh, there's advice for how to treat this specific item. Uh, and then there's also a link to additional documentation about this particular kind of error, what to do about it, um, what causes it, things like that. That's what the little uh, circular help button is on the bottom left. There's also a button to reveal the file in the, in the finder. Um, the solution here is, you know, you need to delete the file and recover it from your backup. Um, so you click Reveal and Finder, and that makes it very easy to toss that in the trash, uh, and then you can proceed with rec recovery. And for any who, anyone that needs additional hand-holding, uh, there's a Help Me button at the bottom there. Um, you know, especially when you're dealing with loss of potentially important data, um, some people just need a little extra hand-holding. So when you click the Help Me button, it wraps up all of this information, all of the context of the backup task and all of the errors that have occurred, uh, and it uh, starts a, a support request, which puts you in direct touch with folks like me and, and Rob, who's in the, the chat channel right now. Mike, I have a question, yeah. if you could clarify a little bit more. Uh, there's sure. one of the questions that about, uh, I think the scenario the person indicated was they had a hard drive that had either failed or, or would not mount, uh, and they were looking for a way to, to repair it. So uh, could you give a good guideline of when they need to go use disk, you know, disk, the data recovery software versus uh, some of the capabilities that Carbon Copy Cloner has? Yeah, sure. And before I answer the question, let me just say that um, I got into this business having provided tech support for people whom I sat down directly across the table from and, and they experienced data loss. And I always hate to, to see people in this position. Um, what we typically recommend is if the volume is still mountable, get as much data off it as possible. And I would typically say, you know, go for the most important data first, uh, your user's folder, for example. Um, when the disk doesn't mount, there's really nothing that I can do to help, unfortunately. Uh, at that point, it's strictly a hardware problem. 
and uh, that's when you would you'd be taking it off to, to drive savers or something like that. Um, if the disk is still mountable, um, then you've got a chance at recovering some data. Some disks do not perform very well uh, when they're in a pre-fail condition, uh, and that's why we would recommend that you go for the most important files first. Once you've gotten as many of the, uh, the more important files off, then you can go back uh, and do a pass where you're trying to get everything. Uh, and sometimes it just takes a really long time. You know, CCC will, will start to read through a file, and once it encounters a read error on that file, the first block that returns a read error, CCC stops right there on that file. Uh, some applications don't do this. They'll actually keep trying to read every single block of the file, even though at that point the file is unrecoverable. Um, but you know, the, the best you can do is is you know sit there and wait and and try to get the most important files, uh, and then go back later for for the rest if possible. Right. So I would uh, I would point out for the benefit of the listener that. Uh, uh, Mike mentioned one recovery house called Drive Savers. Uh, you know, there's another company, I'm sure well-known to Mike, called ProSoft Engineering, and they make a number of data recovery backup tools. Uh, so they might be potentially worth looking at. Uh, they also run, I think, a thing called the Data Rescue Center, uh, an affiliated uh, business where they've built their own lab where they do data recovery as well. So those are some additional resources a listener might uh, look to. Yeah, and uh, there's probably another question that's, yeah. there's probably another question that's right along the same lines. Um, I mean, if you've got files on disk, CCC can attempt to read them. If CCC fails to read those files, they're not recoverable and they're not gonna be recoverable by any other utility either. Um, you know, it's possible that some other utility might try to recover every readable bit of the file and then just leave gaps in it. Um, but in most cases, such a file is gonna be so terribly corrupted that it's, it's not gonna be functional. Um, another scenario though would be like accidentally deleted files. So if you've got files that you accidentally deleted and you don't have a backup, that's where you know, another software utility that actually does recovery and um, you know, file system dumpster diving uh, where it might come in handy. But as far as, you know, if you, you're getting read errors reported by CCC, uh, I would not turn to another utility thinking that they're going to rescue those files because that's definitely not, not going to happen. Right. So in your mind, is there some sort of uh, uh, parameter they should be looking at if they're seeing, you know, uh, you know, files in the log report of unrecoverable of just when a user should start to think, hmm, maybe something bad is starting to happen with my disk and I really should think about replacing it and cloning, cloning that drive before I really get into a world of hurt with a failure. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, and we get this question a lot um, from that help me button. You know, people are, are unsure where do you draw the line. And for me, it differs depending on the source versus the, the destination. Um, if I've got a source disk that's you know, got more than 10 corrupted files, I'm really starting to question whether it's going to faithfully hold my production data. And you, know, you might want to consider replacing it right away. Uh, with the destination volume, though, if we get some read errors on the destination disk, uh, what I often recommend, if it's just a handful of files, I say, let's wipe that disk use disk utilities, write zeros, security option. And what that will do is run a pass across that entire disk, uh, writing zeros, and it'll do a read and a write, and that will find any failed sectors on that disk. The failed sectors get spared out on, on write, not on read. Uh, so when you delete that, when disk utility deletes, you know, all of the little temporary files that it creates, any failed sectors get spared out, and that's going to be the freshest slate that we can start with. Uh, if disk utility can't complete that kind of erasure, uh, if there's some hardware problem that surfaces and disk utility fails, it's time to replace the disk. Uh, if disk utility does complete the erase task and then you run into more uh, media errors on the destination, it's time to replace the disk. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you know, we just see one or two uh, read errors, and it's really not a big deal because you know these things happen. 
Um, every hard drive is, is eventually going to have some failed sectors. So when you erase that disk with the right zeros option, uh, you know, we get a clean slate. And then having followed up with these people in the past, they, they're typically just fine. Uh, but if you get lots of read errors, if we're seeing you know, a dozen files or dozens of files or hundreds of files or thousands of files, then, uh, then we know for sure that it's, it's time to replace this, this disk. Right. OK, so mentioning large number of files, another question here is about uh, memory requirements and um, you know, what does CCC require? Uh, that's kind of a complicated question to answer. Uh, I test CCC. I have tested CCC against a file system with 25 million files. Um, and, you know, I don't know exactly what the memory requirements of that was at the time. Um, but we managed to, uh, to do that just fine. Uh, really, it's, it's hard links to get very technical. It's hard links that uh, throw a wrench in here in terms of the memory requirement. Um, when I'm looking over a file system, uh, if I encounter a hard link, I need to keep track of that. And the next time I run into a file with the same inode, I need to not make a copy of that other file. So we have to maintain a fa fairly large amount of information uh, about our file list as we're making that copy. Um, I don't have specific numbers about what the, the memory requirements are, though. <clears throat> Okay, all right. So um, yeah, I would I would point out that uh, uh, a couple months ago we did a webinar with uh, Kevin Ames, who's a photographer in Atlanta, and he was talking about he how he manages his workflow of uh, seven hundred fifty thousand photos, uh, but that's just the photos. He uses Lightroom, and internally Lightroom has lots of other files. So. You know, all told, he has sort of a working set of you know probably three million files, and he backs up every night using CCC. So um, I think maybe that's an indication of uh, you know the, the tools capabilities. So you want to go back to your presentation? Yeah, sure. Uh, so again, referring back to these media errors, uh, there's another important. And this is a little bit more technical detail about how CCC works that's relevant to the handling of media errors. CCC uses something called an atomic file copying procedure when transferring files to the destination. And what that means is that CCC doesn't modify nor does it delete an existing file on the destination until its replacement has been copied in a whole. So when CCC identifies that a file needs to be copied, it first opens a temporary file on the destination. It writes all of the data into that file, closes the file, and only when all of those steps is completed successfully will it remove or archive the older version of a file on the destination. This is imperative when you're dealing with a corrupt file. Uh, not every backup application works in this manner. If you're using something different, for example, it's going to delete the older version of your file on the destination first, and then it's going to make a failed attempt to copy the corrupted file, and you'll be left with no good copy of that file at all. Uh, in addition to this procedure, CCC can also proactively deal with uh, corruption on the source and the destination. Corrupted files are only discovered when you attempt to read them, and that's an important detail. Uh, so typically, we're only going to discover corruption when on, on your modified file. So as CCC is, is looking through your file system, uh, if it finds there's a file that needs to be updated, it will attempt to read a file. And if that file is corrupted, then you know, it'll raise that to your attention. Your files that aren't modified, though, those are susceptible to something called bit rot. And bit rot is the long-term, slow decay of media uh, over the lifespan of that device. So without realizing it, you could have corrupted files sitting on your source or your destination right now, and you won't discover this until you try to read them. And that could be at the worst possible moment. For example, when you try to restore from a backup because your source disk failed, you don't want to be discovering uh, that you know, some of your less frequently modified files uh, have become corrupt on the destination. 
So we can be more proactive about this. CCC offers a feature called Find and Replace Corrupted Files, which will reread every file on the source and, and destination. Uh, as CCC reads those files, it calculates a checksum, and then it uses that checksum in addition, in addition to file size and modification date to determine if a file should be copied. Uh, so if a corrupted file is discovered on the source, just like I described previously, CCC will issue a report at the end of the task after making two tries to copy that file. Uh, and then the file that's on the destination remains intact. So if there was a file on your source that wasn't modified frequently, but you know somehow fell victim to bit rot, CCC raises that to your attention, and then you can proactively replace that file from your backup. Uh, when corruption like this is discovered on the destination, however, CCC automatically removes that file from the destination and then copies the good copy from the source to the destination. So it actually repairs the problem uh, right away. The process of copying a file is the same on every Mac, but every Mac user is different. Depending on the software that you use or how you use your Mac, there may be cases where CCC's vanilla backup task doesn't quite meet all of your needs. For those special cases, CCC offers hooks into the beginning and the end of the backup task where you can perform additional tasks via shell scripts. We offer several example scripts on our website to help you get started uh, with pre and post flight customization. Place your shell scripts in CCC's application support folder, which you can see here. Uh, the scripts can go anywhere you like, but this is the folder uh, that CCC is going to look to first when you click that Choose Shell Script button. To add a, a pre or post light shell script, you click the Use Advanced button, sorry, Use Advanced Settings button at the bottom of the window, and then you specify your pre and post light scripts over here in the before task runs or the after task runs sections. In this example, I have a pair of scripts that will suspend and resume a parallels, any running parallels VM containers. This is a configuration we'd recommend if you actively use your VM containers uh, during the backup window, so when the backup task is running. Normally, it's not a big deal to make a copy of your files when they're open, um, but it can be a problem if those files change mid-copy. Uh, and of course, that problem is much more likely to occur when copying really large files. So if it takes several minutes to copy a file, there's a statistically better chance that that file gets modified, especially if it's a VM container, which is constantly running and Windows is constantly updating log files or looking for viruses or whatever Windows does. So in this case, uh, what we'll do at the beginning of the task, we'll suspend all of the VMs. And then at the end of the task, we'll resume those VMs. There's some other special cases worth mentioning. Um, in general, when you copy a file from one volume to another, the copy of the file functions in exactly the same manner as the file on the source. So, you know, if you've got a, uh, an audio file, you double click on that audio file on the source, it plays the music. You double click the audio file on the, the backup volume, it plays the same song. Uh, in some cases, though, despite making a bit for bit copy of a file, you get different behavior when opening a copy of some kinds of files. Adobe Lightroom catalogs are a good example of this. Uh, Adobe documents the following on their website. If you move image files outside of Lightroom, the link between the files and the Lightroom catalog breaks. When a catalog can't find a photo, Lightroom displays a photo is missing icon. Uh, here's a screenshot of what that would look like. Um, when you open the copy of your Lightroom catalog on the back, on the backup volume, um, you might see this. This is the kind of thing you would see. Um, if you take that Lightroom catalog and copy it back to the original volume and then open it up there, everything is fine. So why is this? Why does it look different when opening the copy on the destination versus the source? Uh, the reason is that there's volume-specific attributes stored within that ca catalog. Uh, in this particular case, it's probably a volume name. Uh, so for example, the Let's suppose your source volume is named Lightroom, and your backup is called Lightroom Backup. Uh, within the Lightroom catalog on the source, there's references to all of your photo files. And these references have the name of the volume, or the, the full path to that volume. 
So if you eject that volume and then go to your backup disk and open up the Lightroom catalog, Lightroom is going to be looking for files on a volume named Lightroom. And of course, that volume is not present. It's on Lightroom backup is present. So in that case, you know, you would get this little icon that says the photo is missing. And uh, there's a, a blog on uh, Adobe's website that offers some advice for relinking that, that media. But again, if you just copy that back to the original volume, uh, or perhaps rename the volume, uh, and then reopen your Lightroom catalog, uh, then you're all set. And what's important to note here is that this scenario doesn't mean that your backup is invalid. Uh, you simply need to be aware that this particular software requires some extra steps when you're working with a copy. And this is independent of CCC. It's any, any application that made a copy. If you made the copy in the Finder, uh, you would get the same, the same behavior. Uh, so this is just something to be aware of with specific applications. And there's a handful of other special cases that occur for uh, essentially the same reason. One of the biggest things that comes up is application serialization. Uh, we get a lot of people who are frustrated when they boot from the backup, and Microsoft Office and you know all of the Adobe products are saying that they need to be rekeyed or they need to, to re-enter the serial number. And uh, I, I really wish I could do something about that. It's not a matter of me not copying the the software correctly, it's that these companies have an army of engineers whose job is to make it so that you cannot copy their software to another Mac. They don't want you to do this. And uh, technically and legally, I'm not even allowed to try to get around that. Uh, so unfortunately, with some applications, and these all work differently from one another because there's, there's no documentation on how to defeat piracy, uh, so they all do it differently. Um, some applications will ask you to, uh, to re-enter your serial numbers. And then there's a handful of other cases, and we document these, as many of these as we're aware of um, in CCC's documentation. That's what the link is at the bottom. Dropbox and Google Drive, uh, they make volume-specific references in their configurations. The work on, or workaround for those is pretty simple. Uh, little Snitch, they don't tell us why, um, but you know, if you try to, if you, boot from your backup, your little snitch configuration uh, isn't going to be uh, recognized. And then same for the Photoshop scratch disk location. So if you open Adobe Photoshop while booted from your backup, uh, you're, you're probably going to see a message to the effect of, uh, I can't find my scratch disk. And again, that's just because the scratch disk, if you were using the startup disk as the scratch disk, that original disk is no longer present. Um, and it's also a simple workaround. You just Respecify the, the scratch disk. Anyway, we document as many of those as we're aware of uh, on our website. Um, lastly, before we get into QA, I just want to point out that um, you know, the team at Bombic Software is really motivated towards helping our people be successful, helping our users be successful. Uh, and help is just a click away. Um, if you've got a question about CCC, if something's not working quite right, click on the help menu and just choose ask a question about CCC. Uh, that puts in a support request for our help desk. And you know we're around Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Eastern time, uh, here to answer your questions. So with that, I'm sure we've stirred up some more questions. Let's, um, let's turn it over to uh, Q&A. OK, sounds good. So uh, I guess the first question, or there's a series of questions, basically to compare and contrast. Uh, if I use CCC, uh, do I need Time Machine? Should I do both? Um, what is your What is your uh, thought process on that? Sure, we get that question a lot. Um, I'm in the camp of, you know, multiple backups are good. And actually, this it's kind of funny. This my attitude stems from my biology background. Um, one of the things I remember learning in biology is that a uh, homogeneous population is more susceptible uh, to you know, viral outbreak breaks and sicknesses and such. So having multiple backups, and not just on multiple media, but you know, perhaps performed with different software is going to make you m less prone to hardware or software failure. So you know, I don't go out and say, you, know, you should have a time machine backup. Um, but a lot of people ask, and I say, you know, we work just fine side-by-side -side time machine. 
the one thing that we do recommend is don't put them on the same volume. Uh, Time Machine can be a little bit of a space pig. Uh, it does not share the covers. Um, it will fill your backup disk and not make any space left for CCC. So you can use the same backup disk, but if you do, just partition it into two partitions and have one for CCC and one for Time Machine. Okay, Mike, so uh, would you uh, stop sharing your screen and go to your webcams? So oh, sure. They can get, uh, both of our beautiful faces <laughs> and appreciate our charming. good luck, good lucks. Um, so the other question related to Time Machine is, uh, can, you, can you boot from Time Machine? And I think here is, this is a key difference of why coexistence between the tools tools is good. Uh, no, you cannot boot from a Time Machine backup. And that's, that's actually the, the big selling point. Of CCC. Hang yeah, hang on. I'm trying to figure out how to stop the screen sharing. There we go. Yeah, so um, you know, Time Machine is, is nice insofar as uh, if you deleted a file and had several backups that have run since then, or you've got um, um, you're looking for a file several versions old. Uh, time Machine can can help you go back in time for that. But yeah, you can't boot from a Time Machine backup. So if your your startup disk fails um, with Time Machine, you need to run out to the store, buy a disk, come home, take your Mac apart, put in the new disk, boot from the recovery volume, restore, spend hours restoring, and then finally you can get back up and running uh, from your Mac. Uh, but with the CCC bootable backup, you know, especially if you're under deadline or just need to get work done, uh, you just attach your backup disk and, and reboot the system, and you're up on your backup, and you can continue working. Uh, so that's really, it's for me, it's about saving productivity. Yeah, when I get that question uh, of do I need both a bootable backup and a time machine backup, you know, the way I answer it is the bootable backup saves time and energy of having to reinstall, reconfigure all your apps and all your settings. And just imagine all the pain of going out and getting all the passwords and network IDs. And, you know, just, it's not difficult. It's just very, very frustrating and time consuming. Right. Uh, so the bootable back protects enormous amounts of time by doing that. You know, even though there's, you know, more and more comes down, you know, from the Apple Mac store, uh, there are all sorts of tools that, you know, still are not you know, available through Apple. So you have to go out and get them and get startup desks. And that's uh, just time and waste of time and energy that is easy to automate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a couple other questions here. Uh, one from, I'm not sure, it's either Jan or Jan. And uh, the question was about migrating from from an older drobo s which man that was launched back in uh uh back in 2009 i believe maybe 2010. so um there's a couple ways to do it one you can get uh so it depends on what the point of the migration was it was unclear from the question if you you're wanted to get onto a more you know recent drobo uh and if that's the objective uh, then you could buy a new one, like say the Drobo 5D or the Drobo 5DT. Uh, since the questioner mentioned that uh, his or her photo professional photo library were on it, I'd recommend the Drobo 5DT, which is, is designed and has a support package and you know, three-year support designed explicitly for photographers. It's Thunderbolt 2 comes with a uh, you know the SSD MSATA you know acceleration card. Um, so you could just migrate your data pack from one to the other. You turn them off, move the drives over, uh, put them in. The order doesn't matter. You just take them out one to the other. Or if the other objective was you needed more space, um, you know, you could do an upgrade in place, you know, remove a drive, replace it with a bigger one, let it rebuild, you know, or, uh, you could get a newer Drobo, um, populate it with drives and then use what uh, was taught here in the webinar today of just using CCC to copy from, from the older unit into uh, the new one. So that was great. Uh, there was another question, um, Mike, maybe you could uh, clarify. 
the, the question was, this person is running some apps on the Drobo 5N, the Drobo NAS unit, and is wondering, is it possible to use a carbon copy cloner to make a copy of your data on one of its uh, you know, SMB or AFP shares? Yes, yeah, so you can actually choose a NAS volume as the source to a backup task. Um, there's one configuration that we see, though, that you, you could actually choose a, a NAS volume as the source and the destination. So if you had two different NAS devices, you could copy one NAS device to another NAS device. Um, I'm not particularly thrilled about that configuration, though, uh, just because your data is actually traveling twice across the network. Uh, it goes from the NAS to your Mac, uh, and then from the Mac to the other NAS. Uh, so that can be a, a lot of data you're pushing across your network. Um, but yeah, you could specify an as as a source and a locally attached hard drive as the destina destination, and uh, that would be perfectly fine, or vice versa. Okay, and finally, there was a variety of questions touching on uh, off-site backup. And uh, I know we have some recommendations, but uh, first, would you describe what Carbon Copies cloner's capabilities or limitations are in this area? Sure. Uh, there's actually a feature in CCC called uh, Remote Macintosh as a, a source or a destination option. And that's what I use for my own production backups. Um, here on the team, we, you know, we've all got Macs in our home offices. And uh, I've got a backup task on my Mac that specifies uh, one of the Macs in my, uh, my teammates' offices uh, to do backup to there. Uh, so that actually backs it up across the internet. And you know the reason for doing an offsite backup, the reason for doing any backup at all, uh, is it's all about mitigating risks to your data. Uh, and the the number one risk is accidental file deletion. Uh, number two is going to be um, you know, hardware failure, uh, operating system changes, um, and then you know as you get down the line in terms of, of you know, the likelihood of any particular thing happening to your data, you get into things like earthquake, tornado, fire, uh, theft, and things like that. So there is, you know, a smaller percentage of things that you want to protect against so that you're not vulnerable uh, to on-site damage to your data. Uh, so for that, you know, it's a good option to, if you've got a, a, a Macintosh elsewhere, maybe at a friend's house uh, or at work, um, or, you know, you your Mac at work and you could back to your Mac at home, you can use that remote Macintosh option. Uh, and in that case, CCC establishes a secure connection between the two Macs and then pushes just the change files across that connection. So uh, I've been doing that for wait, seven or eight years, and it's, it's been a pretty solid uh, uh, backup strategy. So would you comment on, do you need to do anything special in terms of setting up ports or VPN or do you use back to my Mac? Uh, the How setup to get for across that, the internet. Yeah, the setup for that is is a little bit more challenging, and you know we go through it in uh, in the documentation. Um, it's any any time you try to to get into a Macintosh that's behind a router, uh, you're going to have to do some router configuration to set up port forwarding, uh, and for the remote Mac option, you would set up uh, port forwarding for port 22 to forward that to your uh, the Mac behind your firewall. Um, and then on the, the remote Macintosh, there's a service in the sharing preference pane uh, called remote login. And that's what you would have to enable to, uh, to provide this uh, remote Macintosh option. Right. And I would comment that for listeners here who want to do a remote backup like that, but may not want to scale the, you know, the IT heights to uh, do the setup, uh, to look into the so-called ACN, Apple Consultant Networks uh, members. Uh, there's members all over the 50 states, and uh, they specialize in providing dedicated uh, Mac uh, consulting. And uh, you know, they're quite a great group of guys and gals, so uh, they could certainly help uh, in some of these setup and uh, some of these other issues. Yeah, and actually to that end, um, we've got a, uh, a group of resellers that, uh, that we've worked with. A lot of them are in the Apple Consultant Network. And pretty soon, we're going to have a list of, um, when, when people join that program, we ask them if they would be interested in doing consulting um, and fielding consulting opportunities for CCC setup. 
and uh, pretty soon we're going to have a list of those people that have said yes on our website, um, sorted by region, so that if you're looking for advanced configuration help with CCC, uh, you can go to the ACN list and uh, find somebody that's you know close by to you to get some hands-on help. You know, obviously we're always willing to help you through um, problems with the software if you're running into errors, things like that. Um, but you know, sometimes you just want somebody to sit down with you and uh, help you work through a, a more advanced scenario. Uh, you know, we've got some people with some pretty sophisticated setups. Uh, so in those cases, reaching out to ACN uh, would be a really a good opportunity, a, a good idea for you. Okay, so if there's any last minute questions, if you know, people would type them in. Uh, until that, uh, I'm pleased to announce uh, we've selected a winner at random for the Four Bay uh, Drobo, and uh, it's uh, Mike V at Staff ASSOC. So, Mike, congratulations! Um, you know, we will contact you offline to make arrangements uh, for shipping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, congratulations on that! Uh, and again, for everybody else listening. Um, thanks for your time, and we've created a discount code called BOMBIC100 that you can use at drobostore.com uh, to save $100 off of you know, the Drobo 4 bay, the 5 bay, or the 8 bay units, or even the 12 bay if any of you really need something of that size and that capacity. Mike, do you have any you know, final comments or thoughts uh, for the audience? Uh, one thing that I'm sure people are going to be hot to trot on is uh, Sierra compatibility. Uh, and I'd like to comment that we are ready for OS 10, sorry, Mac OS Sierra. Uh, right now, we're waiting on localization. So we've got a localization team based in Germany. Um, in fact, half of our user base uh, is non English uh, speaking. So our release is ready to go, and we're just waiting on those localizations. And as soon as we get those back, which I'm anticipating being tomorrow, uh, we'll have a release post for OS 10 Sierra, Mac OS Sierra. Boy, I'm going to have to get that right. Um, yes. And then, of course, in regard to Sierra, you know, definitely before you upgrade, make yourself a bootable backup, set that backup on a shelf, and, and then do your upgrade. Uh, if anything should go wrong, not that anything ever goes wrong with Apple updates, uh, you've got that bootable backup that you could, you have in your back pocket uh, so that you can get back to productivity. And really, for me, that's what it's all about. I can't stand having an OS upgrade that just wrecks my productivity. Yes, here, here. We agree with that. So again, uh, there were some questions about uh, off-site backup, and that's a little bit out of the scope of this. Uh, what I would point you to is the Drobo channel on YouTube, Drobo TV. Uh, there was recently, I believe back in late May or it was June, a seminar done with uh, Vanelli, who was a photographer in Florida. He talked about his 3 2 1 strategy, and you know, he uses a Drobo 5D, a direct attached to Drobo 5N network version, and it uploads you know, into the cloud. So, he has a Drobo 5D for his working data, a 5N locally for backup data, as well as a cloud backup. So there's details on that that uh, is described, as well as uh, you know, we'll, we'll be doing another webinar in the, sometime, I'm sure, before year end where we talk about uh, you know, 321 you know, all over again. So Mike, I want to thank you for your time and uh, you know, participation and uh, sharing all your knowledge and expertise with our listeners. And for listeners, again, I want to congratulate uh, Mike, you know, the winner. Uh, and again, the discount code BOMBIC100. Thank you with very that, much for having me uh, I declare It was truly a pleasure. You know, this uh, will be posted on uh, YouTube. So for people who want to go back and revisit it or want to point it to their colleagues, uh, give it a day or two, and uh, it will be available there you know, for sharing far and wide. Thanks again, Mike. You know, thanks again to our listeners. Uh, with that, I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Bye-bye.